All right, welcome to chapter 12, Freshwater Oceans and Coasts. This is lecture one. During this lecture, we're going to talk about uh, the Colorado River, which is the central case for this chapter. And we're also going to uh, do a review of, or an overview of freshwater systems. To get things started, here's an image, a uh, MODIS image, a satellite image of Lake Superior. This is taken on April 8th at 1843 Greenwich Mean Time. And you can see that I'm right about here for right now and I can look across the lake and see the uh, ice on the south shore there. Still some ice accumulated across here on the shore. Apostle Islands look like they're pretty well iced in still at this scale. Coggin Slough, the Bad River area, iced in. Coming up the south, coming up the uh, Keweenaw, quite a bit of, of ice here. Interesting formation, big open area here. Then ice up into the tip of the Keweenaw. A little more cloudy over here in Ontario. There's Michigan Island, uh, of course the Sioux, uh, the St. Mary's River. Coming around to the top here, you can see the, the big bays in the north are still completely iced in, looks like. Uh, Nipigon Bay and Black Bay and Thunder Bay, getting closer to your neck of the woods. Some of you, some of the students here would like to see a little closer in here. Uh, looks like there's some ice around Isle Royal as well. All the inland lakes uh, up here, I can see Lake Nipigon and it's completely iced in, still no open water at all, of course, on that lake at this point. All right, on with the chapter. Uh, the central case uh, for this chapter is uh, regards the plumbing of the Colorado River. Colorado River begins in the Rocky Mountains, travels through the Grand Canyon, and crosses the border into Mexico, where it empties into the Gulf of California. It drains a total of about 246,000 square miles on the, of southwestern North America. It's a big watershed system. Now the waters of the Colorado River irrigate approximately 7% of U.S. cropland, um, provide drinking water to over 20 million people, and keep hundreds of golf courses green in the desert. Um, fill in the swimming pools, fountains of the Las Vegas casinos, and uh, as you may have heard, very little actually reaches the ocean. There's been uh, some legal battles over this, and California was was allowed to exceed its allotment of water for many years. Um, the low average flow into the Colorado River for 78 years left an important reservoir at about half capacity in 2007. Guided by the Colorado River Compact they signed in 1922, the seven states along the Colorado River, Colorado River have attempted to divide the river's water among themselves. In spring 2007, states in the compact allowed up basin states to keep more water. Lower basin states were encouraged to develop supplies elsewhere, and Las Vegas is planning to mine groundwater that will threaten the area's ecology and people. Let you read more about that in the central case. Here's an image uh, that shows the global distribution of water on the planet. And you can see in this first category here, um, this is all the water in the world. If, imagine this column being all the water in the world. Oceans make up almost 98% of all that water. And fresh water is just this little blue line on the top, 2.5%. Now what we do here is that we expand that 2.5% out and take a closer look at the fresh water, the global supply. You can see of that 2.5%, almost 80% is in ice caps and glaciers, another 20% found underwater. In surface water, fresh water, is only about 1% of that 2.5%, so a very small percentage of the overall global water supply. Now let's take a look at that and just break that 1% out right here. And you can see lakes make up about 50% of that in this bottom part here of surface fresh water. The moisture in the soil, about 
atmospheric water, water in the uh, it's, uh, in gaseous form in the atmosphere, is about 8%, uh, about 1% in the rivers, even including all the giant rivers on the planet, the Amazon, um, the, the Nile, the Mississippi. Um, and then a small portion, the last portion here, about 1% within humans, or oh, I'm sorry, within organisms. So as you probably know, uh, water is a pretty good part of your overall body mass and volume. And that water adds up to all the living organisms, about 1%. Just a little review. Uh, in an earlier chapter, I think it was chapter 3, we talked about systems um, we talked about the carbon system, the nitrogen system, the phosphorus system, as well as the hydrologic system. The hydrologic system is the water system or water cycle. And this is the way that water moves right around the, uh, into the different reservoirs. And just to review here, um, if we start, uh, let's start in a river system here. Here's a river flowing along. Um, the sun beating down on that river uh, causes evaporation, right? Uh, plants also lose water. It's called transpiration. They lose it. They take it in their roots, and then they lose it uh, in the sunshine through their leaves. And that water comes up into the atmosphere here. Um, the atmosphere then moves that water uh, and then re-deposits re, uh, it as a liquid, right, as precipitation, as you can see here. So that water moves through the, the, the uh, water cycle. Some of the times it gets locked up for a long period of time in a glacier, and we know that um, continental glaciers and ice caps are melting globally, so we're seeing some of that water that's been locked in for a long time, a higher percentage of it moving back into the, into the water cycle. The place where most of the water is, as you probably can remember from seeing that last image, is in the oceans and look at that number there this indicates the uh, the volume comparative to the other areas and you can see that that's a, a pretty big number it gets in here there's a long residence time meaning that it takes a long time for a water molecule that's deposited in the ocean to make it back out of course water can also make its way to the ocean via rivers okay one of the concepts in this chapter that we want to highlight is the, the concept of watersheds, and I'm going to give you a little quiz here. What is a watershed? Is it a, a, a small house in your backyard filled with water? B, an area of land from which rainwater and snowmelt drain into a particular river, stream, or lake? C, a pond that drains water from your backyard so it doesn't flood your basement? Or D, a very big river that flows into a lake? Have you made your choice? The right answer is B. Watersheds are areas of land from which rainwater and snow melt drain into a particular river, stream, or lake. And in fact, everywhere on, on, the, uh, on land is part of a watershed. And here's a, a look at watersheds in Minnesota. And you can see uh, on this image uh, that there are different scales of watersheds. You can see that the They've color-coded some of the big basins or watersheds. You can see that kind of orange color that shows the Great Lakes Basin. And, uh, and then they've broken that down into smaller sub-basins. And so you and I are in different sub-basins, perhaps. I'm in uh, sub-basin number three right now. And if you're up at Grand Portage, you're in sub-basin one. If you're at the college, you're also in sub-basin three. So we can talk about a watershed address. We can say that uh, here in uh, Duluth or at, at the Fond du Lac College, we're in the St. Louis River watershed, which is part of a bigger watershed, which is the Great Lakes, or I'm sorry, the uh, Lake Superior watershed, over 300 rivers flowing into Lake Superior. Lake Superior is, of course, part of the Great Lakes watershed, and you can see uh, each of the five Great Lakes, and then that colored area around indicates the watershed of those lakes. So here's the watershed boundary, right, of 
Lake Superior going up here, including Michigan. And then uh, now we're in the, if we were right here, we'd be in the Lake Huron watershed. And this whole area is going to be part of the St. Lawrence River watershed over here. And of course, the Great Lakes watershed eventually makes its way into the North Atlantic uh, watershed. So there are scales. And I guess you could say that your watershed is, is the Lake Superior watershed, or you could say that your watershed is the North Atlantic, if you want to go that route. All right, let's talk a little bit about freshwater ecosystems or, or systems. Uh, first of all, let's, talk, let's start with rivers and streams a little bit. Um, rivers and streams, of course, are... One of the things that distinguishes them from other freshwater systems is their flow, right? So they're moving downhill. They have the ability to shape the landscape, as you can see in this uh, forming an oxbow here as this lake meanders and cuts away and, and eventually will make its way right through here at some point. And this will be a little island and eventually probably this will dry up. The river will find a way through. Uh, rivers, of course, are, are pretty... Uh, diverse in their ecological communities and some rivers, especially rivers like the Amazon, have extremely diverse uh, fauna, uh, animals, especially fish populations. I'm recording this lecture in the spring here, uh, spring of 2009, and we've had quite a bit of uh, news about flooding this year and you may I don't know how that happened. You may understand that uh, oops. the area that normally floods uh, in a river, the area around that, the terrestrial area, is called the river's floodplain. Um, so that's an area where the plants and animals are adapted to that type of life. However, sometimes development gets into those floodplains and we get issues. Second ecosystem I want to talk about is um, lake, our lakes and ponds. And the difference between lakes and ponds is they don't have that current normally, that flowing of water that makes life in rivers a little different than life in, la life in lakes. Lakes and ponds are bodies of open standing water that do not actively flow. Okay. We can take in a lake and we can divide it into some different zones. Uh, there is the littoral zone, which is the region ringing the water body, usually a shallow water area, so shallow region. The benthic zone, which is the bottom or of a lake or pond. Also hear that term sometimes used in oceans, but not always. The limnetic zone is the shallow waters away from shore. Okay. So um, the open portion of the lake or pond, but not the deeper portion. And the, the idea here is that in the limnetic zone, light can penetrate into the water deep enough so that the phytoplankton and the algae uh, and the other photosynthetic organisms can, um, can go ahead and do their photosynthesis and make their own food. Deeper in the open water area, below the limnetic zone, is the profundal zone. And this is going to be an open water area that sunlight does not reach. And that's going to lack plant life because there's not enough sunlight. Lakes can be categorized into two major groups. Uh, there are oligotrophic lakes. These are lakes that are low nutrient. So low levels of phosphorus and nitrogen and high, high oxygen concentrations. Many of these lakes are deep. Many of these lakes are uh, very clear. Lake, like Lake Superior, is a very good example. On the other end of the scale are the eutrophic lakes. These are water bodies that have high nutrient concentrations, so high phosphorus and nitrogen concentrations and subsequently have low oxygen concentrations or conditions. There, uh, there is a eutrophication, the, the 
creation of a eutrophic water body can be a natural event, but it can also be sped up, if you will, by changes to the landscape, changes in the watershed, which add nutrients to that water body. There are a variety of other e uh, freshwater ecosystems. Uh, collectively, we can call them wetlands. So marshes, swamps, and bogs are all wetlands we see in Minnesota and, and in the uh, Midwest area. Okay, so there technically uh, there are some differences between marshes, swamps, and bogs. Marshes are shallow water ecosystems with plants growing above the surface. So in the near, as we're looking at this picture below, this part would be called a marsh. Okay, swamps are a little different. They are wetlands in which there are trees uh, involved. Okay, so freshwater swamps are found in forests. Bogs are uh, ponds covered in thick fat mats, excuse me, of vegetation. And so in this case, we're talking about sphagnum often, sphagnum bogs. And you probably know and have seen all these three ecosystems. The last uh, idea that I wanna talk about with freshwater uh, systems is groundwater and groundwater is the water that's beneath the earth's surface that did not evaporate flow into rivers or get taken up by organisms groundwater is found in or contained in aquifers okay so these are below the earth's porous sponge-like layers of rock sand or gravel groundwater is not water you can see but of course we do use quite a bit of groundwater for drinking water in different parts of the world, and for agriculture uh, quite often. The water table is that boundary between the upper layer or zone of aeration and the lower layer or zone of saturation, um, which is completely filled with water. Okay, So it's a boundary area between the upper zone and the lower zone, and it's completely filled with water. The largest aquifer or groundwater deposit in the world is the Ogallala Aquifer. It's located in the U.S. Great Plains region, and it's one of the reasons why that area is so agriculturally productive. However, it is being depleted, especially in some locations, as water is not being sustainably harvested. So it's being harvested at rates that are faster than the ability of the water to um, for water to come into the system. And here's an image of the Aquila, Ogallala Aquifer. And you can see the states that it covers. I mean, this is a giant underground water system. The coloration here has to do with how thick the aquifer is in feet. So the saturated thickness in feet. And so the lighter blue is anywhere from zero to 100 feet and all the way up to that darkest color blue, which we see a big deposit up here in Nebraska, is 800 to 1,200 feet of water there. So that this is a this is in a sense a, a giant lake under the earth. All right, water is unequally distributed across the Earth's surface, as and we uh, we come from a, you know in this area a very water rich. Um, area but there are of course places where water is very scarce and where it actually really never rains. So global freshwater distribution is very uneven and so rainfall varies from nearly zero in certain areas up to 1200 centimeters or 470 inches per year in others. So just a tremendous difference between the, the dry areas and the wet areas of the earth. Canada has 20 times as much water per citizen as does China. So we often think of Canada as being the most water rich per person continent in the world, or a country in the world, excuse me. And of course, China's a very large country 
And so, and Canada is a very small country as far as uh, compared to, to numbers of people who live in China. Here we go. Here is an image uh, from your book, and this map has available fresh water in cubic meters, so a volume per capita, per person, per year. And so it ranges from less than a thousand in those areas that are kind of that peach color. So Northern Africa. Um, then we get into the 1,000 to 2,000. We can see a region here and here. Some of these other places that we associate with being fairly dry. Uh, then we move all the way down to regions of, you know, where there's 20,000 to 100,000 cubic meters per capita per year. And look at, you know, here's Canada, very water rich. Parts of South America, very water rich, etc.